Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. What was said in the last dialogue and about Orlando, I, I know uh, what this means about the different identities. I know this is actually my identity in a publishing house. I do e-books but also print and I actually started off with the new publishing firms four years ago. Uh, and I co-founded uh, a first uh, uh, well, publishing house and uh, uh, used Bravo instead, Bravo Publishing House. Uh, well, we wanted to use that and uh, actually we were, were uh, under uh, legal action and so we chose a different name and I think this was something to, that is about authorship so that a publishing house is sort of aesthetic work and sort of culture and I started again afresh after four years and also said uh, this is a, my own name, this is a startup, so it's not something that is to be sold to a group of publishers. This is my work. The Roman Verlag has two points of focus, so new literature, so new forms of literature that are created on the internet. Well, of course, I always use dreadful terms, I think which is also a dreadful term. So everything in, in media in this relation is, is a dreadful term. But you've got the freedom and the accessibility you can create. And I think this is important and the reason why I'm here, because students and youth literature is not really my focus, because I worked classically, very theoretically. And for some years I've been interested in network culture, so cultures that are created on the network. And there I also have to do with youngsters in some ways, for example Facebook, they have a literary form. And these are a special form of, of poetry and a short uh, texts where friends or real or virtual friends well you, you actually shouldn't shouldn't make that decision I know but and they uh, create poems like you're the most beautiful etc and you, you are the best so this is the form of poetry they create it's just as you should say oh it's all YouTube in the same direction but they have their own fascination but within this age group it means a lot so it is important to uh, get into touch with those groups so it's always interesting as a cultural phenomenon so what is hybrid and hybrid writing between network and offline cultures uh, brings people together and topics together in a sort of loop and this is my thesis for today and as you've heard the processes are well the opposite uh, with me so I don't read a book that describes a specific procedure and then I implement that in my work in the publishing house but normally I see a sort of phenomenon, observe that on the network, on the internet. And, oh well, first of all, I'm passive and observe it. And then I start to interact and communicate. And then I make suggestions how this can be turned into a more concrete project. And then it is either something where you block something or do an apology. Or, and then I start with my theories. And the projects I would like to mention today uh, is something I didn't start out with in a theoretical way, but at a specific point I noticed that they can be copied. I think that it makes sense to copy them, and it's a good form of being productive in a sort of uh, teaching way. It's also niche topics that can be covered in this way, and it creates and gives a voice to children and youngsters uh, who so far, according to my opinion, are underrepresented in literature and youngsters. I start with uh, the topic of a thousand deaths or hashtag, of course everything needs a hashtag in the internet. 
Mid end last year, I started this project. It started out with an idea of myself. Uh, at some point in life, I wanted to write a literary book, and it was supposed to contain a thousand short stories on death. So deaths, real deaths that happened, that existed in life, or that it was um, reported about, so a bit of anecdotes. But at some point I noticed it's a very old-fashioned way of doing things, and thinking of a project which doesn't fit me normally, and that I have so many people around me to communicate with. So everyone at some point in life has lost someone, or has to deal with death in a professional way, or looked into it in a methodological way. But there are different ways of dealing with it. So actually, we cannot think of, of death ourselves. We just experience death when death happens to someone else. But there are different facets, cultural facets, and also professional facets, and well, naive, emotional facets, you call them. And in particular because we have a sharing uh, culture on the net. So it, it's not saying we have a big discussion, I'm a professor, I've got a PhD, I teach there, and I am uh, the leader of this course. No, in particular with phenomena that are difficult to explain rationally, there is a whole range of facets available. And therefore, I had a call set up amongst my friends and people I knew that they worked with them for publishing house and I told them please write me short um, text about death, 3000 characters and um, a thousand deaths that was the title Not, um, I wanted to have a thousand texts about death in the end so writing about a thousand deaths that was the title. This was the, the outline. Uh, I've got about 600 so far after roughly a year, and I wanted to publish this as an ebook and have different versions published because this I knew was a project that I could work on for ten years and publish a thick book in the end, but. I think more interesting it would be to publish it in stages and show the tenseness of the work. You can um, work an open ebook, so you might, might have empty containers, but it's not always closed forever. It's also a culture of fear for many people that they say, oh, well, this is a book, and I rely on that book, and I quote the book, and the next version, you find something else. And I didn't even know of that it was changed. Well, this is um, an unknowing um, understanding, because well, content doesn't get lost even if there are changes. And we just started. Well, first of all, in the circle of friends and acquaintances, and quickly a dynamic evolved that was incredible. I've been working for a long time in the publishing sector and also for publishing houses and also authors. And our authors can get irritated if there are changes, etc. They're always under stress. And all those things didn't just happen in this project. There were just one or two uh, confusions because there were mistakes in the last version. Um, it was already corrected, etc. Oh, of course, if you are converting things, uh, they can have new mistakes. So how can it happen again? I mean, we corrected in the last version. I mean, that was the confusion there. But it's interesting, it's a, it's a mixture. So people also very recognized and renowned authors, Clement Sitz, for example. So these are the people involved, but also very unknown um, authors, um, for example. This is the balance that was created. So we have professional and trained or authors that are represented, and on the other hand, you've got people who just want to write. 
and due to self-publishing, they can also publish that. And this project just leveled that out. I don't say, I, of course, I have, I want to have big names as well. I'm pleased to have them because this also creates an awareness for the project. But those known authors don't behave as usual in their interaction with publishing houses. We also have other projects and there, there's a different communication that we have with each other. And this is what gives me the first feeling that if we talk about those last questions, not about rationale, but with emotions, then there people get away of their social needs and social corners. They're more relaxed and more accessible and um, find their way into larger groups and we can create great projects. This is the cover. Well, it's black on black, unfortunately. Well, this, the ebook has got an advantage. You've got the development that in the first phase of ebook culture, many things were taken over by the ebook culture without any meaning, mostly. We just did the things because we're used to do it with a book. So, for example, that uh, reading apps uh, have pages, although with an ebook in the production you don't have pages. Or just uh, nonsense like just uh, you get the, the sound of turning a page, etc. But it was important at the beginning to just establish and make this new culture accessible, and it was brand new. And if you've got something that you're used to, that you're familiar to, but it's it's important, but at some point you also have to detach yourself from the old culture because you've got the problem to get away from that and prevent yourself from thinking that uh, the ebook is just a copy of a real book. So you can do things with an ebook that are just not possible with a normal book. In particular, you can risk things. For example, what I risk here, a thousand deaths. I mean, this is just time of life that I risk here. But this is actually important. I just could, I was able to risk that I, I was not there uh, with thousands and thousands of uh, printing costs. As I just let it flow, as you say, on the internet. So this was possible, and that it worked out at every single stage. This is wonderful, a wonderful experience. And sometimes it's a sort of well, a community of faith, if you like. And at the same time, you've got one text, and then you uh, have reactions from others. They're all very friendly. The authors also got in contact. They became friends. Also, established relationship during readings. And uh, they said, "Well, I'm particularly affected by you know, your story." And they twittered. And they also have a mailing list, and they started to get in touch with each other and became friends. And it all brought me to the one point where I said, well, this is the number of, of authors of those taking part in the project, so it's a whole bunch of names. And you have to imagine that every single one of those participants has a different story to tell. The ratio of um, applications, well, normally it's like if I ask people to, to take part, it's one third that say, yeah, I don't have time, one third say no directly, and one third say, yes, um, I take part. But here it was just two refusals that I got. And the others all took part, they were part of it immediately. Well, for example, we just heard about the traumatized young children. And they, well, of course, we didn't experience death and, fall, uh, and uh, torture, but death can also be difficult to cope. And it is difficult to deal with that topic also when you, you talk to people. And uh, for example, if I talk to someone on, and she said, well, I've just lost my, my father, for example, then uh, I said immediately, no, uh, just get over that first, and then we talk about that again. And I wouldn't have asked if I had known. 
For example, some start to cry when they read the new version, and many try to put everything into the text to cope with the matter. But it's also a gratefulness of the experience, and I also am grateful to start the project. Uh, well, reading that and correcting the text is uh, difficult. To read, well, a thousand texts about death is not so easy. But uh, I found a position for myself. I'm just a membrane filter, and I let it go through. And I'm looking at it from a distance. So this is a functional distance. So to speak. But I can let it go again when uh, it is published, because otherwise it would be difficult. But I have to, uh, of course, uh, give me a break in between. But uh, through that year, when I had the one year experience, I said, well, no one told me, well, this was a nightmare. I, uh, if I had known, I wouldn't have taken part, etc. And I also worked in New Havens with you uh, testimonials. And there I learned that you shouldn't push for someone to tell you something or tell you their story. You, you of course, can offer to come to someone to record the story, and, but you shouldn't push someone to tell it. And I just invited people to take part, but I, I wasn't pushy. I didn't say, yes, hey, uh, you just have to uh, remind you you wanted to write something. No, uh, it stop immediately if people are hesitating. But in this extensive, quite extensive experience, in this a larger group of authors from different uh, fields and backgrounds and different literary background, I noticed that I could even dare, and for the book I would love to dare, well, the, the, the original idea was a multi-facet picture of what death actually is in our society. Well, for example, normally we said death was just pushed back and not, uh, uh, it's not a topic anymore in our society. This is also today changing where experts say that death is the people dying that just disappeared. It's not death that disappeared. Well, many things are changing here. Uh, and I know many people who just don't want to talk, they don't like to talk and, and feel uncomfortable when they have to talk, and especially if someone dies in the family. And others are freer in dealing with the topic. And it's just a multifaceted book where you find texts that are highly philosophical or expert uh, texts, or very literary texts, and also very simple and personal and fact-oriented reports. So, so everyone can find access to the book. It's also a reading experience that the readers of this e-book can or also do report on. Well, some don't like it, but this is something that uh, doesn't uh, well harm or damage the book as such. Others will come and like it. So. I don't have a quality uh, expectation. I refuse texts, but not many, just some that are just too complicated. If, for example, a 17 year old publishes, uh, uh, or a 35 year old publishes on philosophy, um, and it's, it's just not interesting. So uh, I just leave it out. But normally, I get into contact with the authors to accept the text. But there are texts that come in that are just immaculate. So it is set in stone. I can print it uh, and publish it as they are. I had a wonderful experience with Alan Poser, who is quite an unknown uh, publisher of fact books. And I had a contact with him from my publishing work. And I told him, yes, I'd love to have you. Uh, with the book, and if you've got access to the topic, and then he wrote an email back to me. It was not an answer, and I said, "We just want a mere sentence, something that I was well confused about." And, well, of course, if you don't have time, just tell me. But when I opened the mail again, I noticed 
uh, that there was a file attached and within half an hour he wrote his text. I'm not sure whether uh, he had it prepared already or whether he wrote it in that half hour, but he sent it back to me immediately. So it's just the, the perspective that is important, how you see yourself and how people see you in society. This is also what happens when you do that, such a project. And then I had the idea that I would love to have more young people in the project. Many texts come from people of my age and even older, and people who just lost their relatives. It's a very intense phase that they go through and that they just try to work through in their text. Very intensive text, but uh, we had a whole range of them already. So maybe I open up a new trend so that I change direction in a way and publish more facets. So I try maybe to say included, for example, in teaching lessons. I would have loved to have texts of young, very, very young people. For example, it could be the death of the hamster, or just the idea of what death can look like. I can remember that I thought of death as a child, and my children now already experience um, death of, of a friend of them. It's interesting how they dealt with it and to observe how they dealt with it. And of course, they can do that gradually and carefully, also when they are supported, and also, uh, via teachers, with the help of teachers, I tried to uh, win over uh, the class of my son when he is 12 years old. And of, of course, uh, it is a hard topic and, and they were a bit of afraid of dealing with that. But uh, normally, children don't think it is such a hard topic. It's normally uh, the adults who think it's a difficult topic, but children don't think it is difficult. And I went there and the class is an interesting class at a very interesting school and I, therefore, I mean, this is the relevance for today. It's um, a secondary school where 85% uh, of the children have a migratory background. I think uh, there well, one or two uh, children that are uh, not having a migration background. So, you don't have uh, cliches, it's the other way around. It's very normal that you have a migration background. You have uh, um, youngsters sitting there that are open, they're open to everything, open to, to offers. And this is why I dared to go there, because you, I knew the children were open. And the teacher was supporting me. We went to um, a cemetery, for example, and we were also drawing pictures of when people died, when there was a war, etc. And then the next day, I also talked about death a little bit, so funerals and the way of mourning around the world. And then I asked them, and again telling them, if you've got a good feeling, I don't want to force you, I don't want to push you, if you don't want to do it, you can take another form, if you don't want to write something down, but just try to tell your personal story, try to remember something that you experienced or just an idea that you have and to bring it on paper or just draw a picture, whatever you like. And this was absolutely impressive. This is a press review about a thousand deaths. The three versions have been published so far and have not yet done any press work yet because I want to keep it a bit personal and not already have it on a PR marketing tour. And I have to add one thing, which also is part of everyone taking part. We will donate every income to a children's hospital. So, uh, well, of course it wouldn't make sense otherwise with so many authors, we would get uh, 0.23 cents per author uh, as uh, income, but we all donate it to hospital, children's hospital. Well, it's also on, on Twitter, and we also have uh, 
quite an attention already in the news. We have already quite an attention. And uh, well, in the end, if there's a print version, then of course we have it in the classic reviews. But uh, at, at the moment, I don't know how to actually deal with it properly at the moment. So we had this first text, and uh, whenever we read it out, it was it was it was great. It, I don't I have to take care of myself that I can't start crying. It was really great how to see. Uh, how the classes also reacted and how they were activated, how they, the children between each other really uh, had, a, had a good feeling among each other. There was nobody too shy. There was one really who completely, uh, completely shied away because um, he had somebody in his family who had just died and he had written a text that was kind of more abstract. But. Uh, I told him, try and rewrite this text if you if you can start already to talk about these feelings, and that's when he when he started painting because I, I pushed that child too hard, and he had to get outside and started crying again, and and said then that he was happy that I I started dealing with him about this. This is uh, about a Muslim. About a Muslim child, because we have different children from different cultural backgrounds, and all of these texts that uh, we see, that we receive uh, have uh, special backgrounds, and which is enriching for all the readers, and it's necessary also for the understanding for the, of the readers uh, in our multicultural in our multicultural society. It, it really becomes uh, something conceivable now. These texts, I think, will make a great difference because they are in contrast with uh, adult texts. And with very classical texts, we saw that already in the in the debate about the help for refugees when people start uh, talking about their grandma that came from Pomerania, and we are also we were also refugees and had to flee. Um, they do not. They do not. They cannot be used to become just one and to see the different backgrounds and the different origins. This is a text by Lawrence, my son. It's it's way too long, of course, but I can uh, I can give you that later on if you're interested. He wrote in a more philosophical way, and then at a certain point, he he referred and uh, tried to refer to this uh, very personal experience because he he writes the text that is furthest away from religion. We are very idealistic at home, and the others they they were very much motivated. Real, religiously the other texts that we that we, that we received and that created a much more proximity because we can say uh, that we then started talking about Islam for example we started about different details the, the, the value system if you are feasting in, in front of other uh, other children um, that kind of created an association to computer games uh, in me. It was not only about death, there was a, a huge closeness, a huge proximity um, among us and the children. And uh, of course, things have to have been tried before to be integrated into the classrooms, but they, they didn't manage to do that. But we did with our text. This was the text by Debetu. It's also too long. But I'll read it. We have no translation. Er war gerade acht Jahre alt und konnte es nicht akzeptieren, dass er weg war. Und das alles wegen dieser Zigaretten. 
das Letzte auf der Welt, was ich empfehlen könnte. Bei seiner Beerdigung hatte mir mein Vater versprochen, dass ich ihn ein letztes Mal sehen darf. Doch die Menschen, die ihn wuschen, haben mich weggeschaut. Because cross and uh, women cannot take part in this. That was a detail that we didn't know about before, about a Muslim funeral, that, uh, that uh, a teenager who's standing there in jeans, for example, and with his uh, sports bag in front of you, they also, you, you notice how they, how they deal with these limitations that they have. It's also about those 2,500 or 2,050 identities that we talked about before. It's an, she conceived it, of course, as, uh, as wrong that she couldn't go and see her grandfather anymore at the funeral. Again, we have no translation. Ich möchte euch mitteilen, wie schwer der Tod meines Opas für mich war. Wenn euch das schon passiert ist, dann tut es mir sehr leid. Meine Familie und ich fuhren eigentlich nur nach Indien, um zu schauen, wie es unserem Opa geht. Als er ankam, lag er aber im Koma. Ich konnte es nicht mit ansehen, wie er da in seinem Bett im Krankenhaus lag. Ich hatte ihn immer noch fröhlich und lachen zu sehen. Seine Situation verschlechterte sich von Tag zu Tag. Deshalb brachten wir ihn in ein besseres Krankenhaus. Ich hatte Angst davor, dass er stirbt. Weil wenn man jemanden verliert, kommt derjenige nicht zurück. Er lag fast drei Wochen im Koma. Keiner wusste, ob er aufwachen würde oder nicht. Ich hatte Angst, sehr große Angst, um ehrlich zu sein. An einem Tag ging ich nach Hause, um Bekannte und Freunde zu besuchen und in dieser Nacht hat uns Opa dann verlassen. Ich ging am nächsten Tag zum Krankenhaus und da wir in Indien waren, wurde mein Opa Feuer bestattet. Dieser Moment war am schlimmsten, weil mir klar wurde, dass ich meinen Opa nie mehr wiedersehen würde. Es war das letzte Mal und ich weinte. Ich wollte es nicht glauben, dass er tot war. Mein Papa hat Opa angezündet. I won't carry on reading. That was the sentence when me and everyone in the room that were reading it, we, we, almost, uh, we almost fainted because the, that little boy is loving his grandfather and he expresses that in the text. And then there's this one sentence that makes it the very difference. And this is what in this whole project is happening and what, what has this, this intercultural um, this, this intercultural um, possibility of not creating limits anymore because it doesn't matter where the children are coming from and then they have of course these, these socially determined experiences which of course are enriching because you can experience them now in this context not by saying you have to deal with this in this culture it is important for our society but it happened in a very normal you know in a in an almost natural way at the school there, we, uh, we wanted to create the feeling for the, for the whole picture. I wanted text from the children and the adolescents as a publisher. Of course, it was in my interest to have this diversity of the texts of younger people. But then, in my practical work, I noticed what actually it, it, it does to these young people, what it did to the class, and how much more had derived from it than I had expected, and how much more had actually happened on different levels. And I thought it might be something that we could, of course, foster also in other environments, in other uh, classes. One that takes part in my project is a, a priest, from Baden Württemberg, and he wrote a concept recommending it then to his teachers uh, at schools there. So that is a, a way of dealing with this topic. It's not just to say that, well, from and Verlag now had a great idea, but to, to open it up and to create individual solutions, to use that individually, saying, I am um, working, for example, with, with an adolescent, with a youth group, and I could use it there. It's creating a link between groups that normally maybe have less links. And what I learned from this project is how unbelievably uh, positively valued this was by the, the writers, the young writers, because they can write these, these texts that normally aren't writers. And they can see that, of course, as a, as a great value to take part in this, as an upgrade to say so. And um, there's, they are so grateful. I get so many emails. Uh, this is what the, what the children experience.
You can create a self-confidence with that and also give value to the children that they have. They have voices that are very interesting. And to make them hearable is what we do in this in this con in this context. And to to also give uh, give that to a broader audience, to a broader public. That's what we do with this with this project. To uh, to create also these 2000 and X identities that we have in our society around one table and item tisch that's my new project we started that this summer and it's an argument over Twitter sometimes on the web we uh, it uh, things happen that you that you start arguing about uh, after five minutes and you you will never talk in your life again to each other and we thought that. Uh, we should get away from that. So that was the idea. And in this whole, uh, in this whole argument, in this whole discussion about Pegida, uh, that was overwhelming us. Overwhelming us. People saying, uh, "Are they gone crazy? How do people have to feel that are sitting in the refugee camps now? How will everybody look from outside at us?" And I, I got excited about that myself. And for the first time, I felt kind of a, 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 a huge. I was hurt. I was hurt. In my uh, in my view on on Germany and on the world, and I thought that we have to do something against that. And the time is already joined was something that I could really feel. It was something that had been written down uh, long before, but in a more naive phase, I wanted to do something positive. I wanted to do something constructive, and then to come back to what we said before, uh, I think that the pictures have have. Uh, have gone into the focus and the text really lost their meaning and in certain situations that we have in the special situation that we have now in politics people just don't listen anymore we do not argue anymore with with rational arguments because uh, words do no longer do no, no longer work they are no longer heard so we need a, a positive brain wash to say so i think and we use the the images uh, about of people from from persons with a migrational background, for example, in Germany, to to create this positive feeling. I created a hashtag. It's my migrational background, and I kind of uh, developed the feeling that basically every one of us uh, has kind of a, a link to this in their family background, maybe even outside of Germany. And if we start thinking about that, everything is completely absurd what we talk about now. So you have a problem with your, your grandma from Pomerania, like we mentioned before, for example. All that became just one. And uh, a, a cultural expert from Berlin who's living in Sweden now, um, she, she sent a reply on Twitter, which was very bad, that she felt it very naive and was completely mad about that. And um, I started to talk to her. I started to I started emailing with her. And then we I, I, I emptied that hashtag. And uh, we really started a discussion and conversation on the web. And uh, we tried to figure out what could we do uh, which would be more positive, because in all of these actions that we take now at the moment, there are things that are patronized, that are categorized, that you start talking for the refugees, the poor refugees, they've gone through so many bad things. And uh, I make this m my issue now. And in the, there are a lot of things in the newspapers about what is going wrong, the bad politicians, and so on. But it would be much more important now to start uh, taking the people behind these statistics out to listen to their stories. This is what is happening now over the last few weeks. But the, the, the movement at the beginning was very different. There were just the, the refugees, and uh, we had those very superficial uh, reports in the press. So we thought about what we could do. We would address adolescents and children from families that had just come a couple of months ago or maybe a year ago to bring them together in very small groups of just two children or adolescents in events with, let's say, two riders that had families uh, with a migratory background that had come for uh, a very long time ago to Germany. There are many writers now that are very famous nowadays that came, for example, with their families in the 80s uh, after the, the Balkan War as well. And our idea was that they could possibly, it could possibly be easiest for them to say 
what else can we do apart from any charity or uh, other nice project um, but really get into a discussion really get into a debate that does not project all the time that does not and that does also render different perspectives onto things that can make the difference uh, that can share this experience but in the same time is much more has become much more integrated uh, a citizen of germany and uh, very easily we felt that the people that had come earlier to germany as refugees that have a good life now in germany are driven actually driven by the necessity to help we met one young man that was at our first event hamid who came from a 14-headed uh, lebanese family and he says that even if he was a quite an, an angry boy uh, during his youth he actually had a, a great childhood in germany and felt and feels very grateful of how his family was integrated and welcomed and he's doing something now um he got to know by happenstance about this uh, this refugee camp in Calais which kind of was created in autonomously which has no support whatsoever and there's a few thousand people there and he's he's driving there with a truck from Berlin full of donations over there and he says he is the one that really can enter that he's not a, a journalist of the uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine for example with a, with a strange intention behind he's just a, a guy and uh, he, he, he actually has the, the street credibility to let him in there and that they started talking to him and he started telling us the stories from this refugee camp this is he created a blog this is how we got to know him and uh, we noticed that this is actually what we had thought before that people do not really have the f do not really have the desire to be like the refugees they just they want to they want to have normality they want to be spoken to they want to be they want to accompany other people they want to work here and this is what they want this is their desires our first uh, the first dinner that we had was with a, a person that uh, came eight that uh, started their escape from syria eight months ago and then Anna Dushima, for example, she's working for a BuzzFeed, she's just a cool journalist coming from Rwanda and there survived his, uh, the genocide. Um, part of her family couldn't, but the, her mother uh, escaped with uh, her and her sisters. She was one of the organizers there and Maria Müller who also writes a lot about this uh, subject. So we had this first evening in Berlin. to find this here you can see some pictures now just like with uh, thousand Tode it, this evening it turned out so much better than we had actually expected it to be we went there and we I thought well just be relaxed I don't know maybe just uh, she's the, the the nice lady who's who's just thought about this idea and then we'll see what happens and the boys are are going there just because they think they have to and we'll be sitting there all among uh, foreigners but it actually wasn't like that we first had uh, conversations among two persons just like at any normal event in berlin people that had been there for quite a while started talking about their jobs or what they were doing hamid gave me some manuscripts the classical publisher party situation everything was very normal and then this conversation started and uh, from that the derives the idea that uh, even if we have this ascetic uh, picture of of, um, of victims and we actually do not like to hear that they have a they had a normal life and just left because of war and then before even were, were on facebook had uh, had trendy clothes and even money for the smuggler as if they, that would make a difference in the end uh, when they when the people arrive here with a trauma so Hamid was speaking Arabian which was a great uh, which was positive of course and Niederin had just arrived a couple of months ago and even if always when language is the problem uh, you and you have you you go somewhere you have these these great ideas but language just turns out to be a problem then of course uh, you 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 come to limits you come to points where you where you can't express certain things in a correct way and that of course was uh, 
was a great um, opportunity for us that Hamid was able to speak uh, Arabian in these situations. And this is how the conversation started. It was just great, it was wonderful. And we could ask questions later on about um, can we confront people actually with these topics that are really that emotional, that are really getting that close to people. Um, I keep, I kept asking that girl, what about your father? Uh, do you want to talk about that maybe, the one that had been murdered in Rwanda? And these were the moments where she had to swallow, of course, as well, but then she was able to answer. And uh, you noticed that she, she was happy about this question, that she didn't block things because we, we took the cruelty from that. And what I learned that evening and what I want to apply again uh, onto something that you can use in mediation, in literature or in culture, cultural issues is that these people that have been here for a while or for long even that can speak German, that are here legally, that have the rights, the rights that have the privileges of our country, that they are kind of guides and translators in our situation nowadays. What we heard before, we have to make it. There is no other possibility. We have to make it. We have to mobilize these people because, of course, they have experienced different facets of that. And that is a, a smart idea, actually, to do that. So my idea would be to use Tausend Tode und an einem Tisch uh, as, as hard copies, actually, for something not just simply to be posted on Facebook, but something that was taken out of the web and to give it back to the web. I'm not somebody who says, well, this project here uh, now is, is created and it, it copied Tausend Tode or an einem Tisch. Uh, we have to use a franchise uh, to use that project. No, the idea is from the groups that you're working with to create new structures that um, in which you use the strength of these groups, in which you analyze them, you start working on them and then give people a voice. And digital publishing actually is the ideal medium for that because not without any resources, but really with uh, minimum resources, you can you can start publishing, you can create ebooks, you can write blogs, and just simply bring voices to the outside that are of importance. This is a sentence that my son coined uh, or it brought back home uh, after two weeks at the school. It's a question of perspective. He didn't say, well, mama, uh, you, you hear that they speak Arabian at home uh, because they pronounce things differently. He said, mama, I'm the only one who's speaking just one language fluently in this class, and that is true. And this is the potential that is there behind and the possibility that is there behind. It's the, the, the task of mediating in literature, not just simply to make it possible that uh, writers are writing about m m being different, being others, but uh, to, to also write about that we have people already here in our country that are different, that are uh, others, that can write literature now that has a certain relevance for children that have grown up just simply differently from children that have grown up since the 1970s here in Germany. And with that, create literature at, at uh, extraordinary places, extraordinary spaces, and do not have to think about uh, support, financial support, sponsoring, about publishing, about uh, manuscripts, and so on, who will help me with that. But that digital publishing actually makes it possible to say, we create a project week in my youth group, in my class, in my town, and within next to no time, you, you have something develop uh, with voices that usually are socially discriminated against in our country. And this actually is uh, more or less my finishing message, that it is not only possible but also, like we said before, necessary. We have to make it. Really it is our responsibility for us to to take these different voices inside and make them hearable that we have in Germany and to let them express themselves. There are no reasons why not to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> are there any questions to Ms. Fuhrmann? Um, 
One question to your first project, Thousand Tode. I think that's very interesting. And I could, could have actually contributed a lot to this. Maybe I will in the future. Are there maybe sometimes stories coming in uh, whom you, you wish actually death to? Please take the microphone to answer. Yes. Well, uh, there is one of these stories inside, and uh, this is what I what I like so much about it because after a short time, you have been so um, so relaxed emotion emotionally, and you, you leave out these classic moralic moralistic uh, ideas, and then there comes one story that says, "Well, my ex friend died. My ex boyfriend died. He didn't even have the." Uh, the feeling like to say goodbye to me, things like that come in. And then in another version, for example, uh, somebody said, uh, I just, uh, there was a, a change in my professional life and I think I want to use my Twitter name in this. So there are changes also in this context that are created. Uh, people that have written texts that are more more of a protest, they have to, to stand against a lot of things, of course, as well. In this huge community, in this huge group, there is a lot of sometimes also nonsense, right, of things. Uh, but I think that this diversity makes it so so great, makes it so fruitful.